Good evening, everyone. We have a very special guest tonight at Club E20, Maurice Pomeranz, Professor Maurice Pomeranz from New York Abu Dhabi University. And uh, I will allow Maurice to tell us about himself as much as he wants, but you all received an invitation and we put most of the information there. Maurice, you are on. Myself. Thank you very much. Um, it really is an honor and a privilege. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. I should say good evening to everyone. Dobri vecher. Wa mesal khair. As we say in Arabic. Um, uh, I actually am always embarrassed to talk about myself. Uh, biography, I find uh, we, I was just listening to a musician who said this, and I thought it was very opposite. Um, we, often, um, we often emphasize aspects of our biography having importance, and then we leave out actually, they're important to us, but we leave out the parts that actually probably are uh, more important to the subject. And our subject for today, so I'm gonna sort of leave it at that. that my biography will come into this uh, very soon, but, um, uh, but um, our, our topic for today, um, and I'm going to share my screen now and actually play. Good, can everyone see that well? Yes. Okay, good. Our, our topic for today is a tour through the Library of Arabic literature. Um, and you'll note that the Library of Arabic Literature is in italics. Um, and you'll find out why that is very soon. Um, as for, uh, I don't know the ground rules of this. I'm used to teaching uh, at New York University Abu Dhabi. I teach uh, undergraduates. I've taught graduate students in New York University. And I've, like everyone, um, managed with Zoom now uh, for the last uh, two years or so. And one of the ground rules that I have, I, I think lectures could be interactive. And this one certainly is designed for some, some level of interaction. Uh, so please, if you have uh, some questions, don't you can use the raise your hand function. And I will try uh, and unmute yourselves if that's possible. And then you can kind of jump in and ask um, when the question is still um, uh, well, fresh in your mind. Um, there are natural stopping points as well in this lecture. It's in it's a lecture um, in sections. Um, Thank you. So everyone, we still raise a hand. No one just speaks. Will just raise your hand, and you'll be have a, you'll have a chance to ask a question. Thank you, Maurice. All right. Um, so let's begin our tour. Um, we begin with a tale of two libraries. Uh, and you'll see what I mean by that. It's a little biography here, I guess. Um, I, as you can see, I, I did my degrees at the University of Chicago. And in around 1999, I would often find myself in this very large building uh, on the campus, the one that's the modernist building. It was designed by the same firm that built the Sears uh, Tower. Not the most beautiful building on the outside, but it contained treasures inside. Um, and one day I got thinking about this question of libraries. Um, and um, this question is still with me, I think. Um, and the first question I asked myself is the basic one, how many books are in this collection? Um, you can play that kind of guessing game. You all live in the Boston area. You kind of know what Harvard uh, has in their holdings. I look back to check and see what the numbers were. It was around 11 million books at that time. Now it's jumped to 12.6. So um, I don't know how many of those are digital. So around 11 million books. Um, in 1999, I was already a student in um, Arabic studying in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. I was interested in how many, what the percentage of the books uh, in the Regenstein Library were in Arabic. It was reputed to be one of the best collections in the world. Well, um, around 2% of the total uh, were in Arabic at that time. Um, 220,000 books is pretty good. 
um, actually, it really is one of the best collections in the world um, outside of probably uh, Princeton and Harvard, which buys even you know, car manuals in Arabic. Um, now, how many of these were actually translations of Arabic texts at that time? Now we're getting much smaller. Uh, in fact, um, I would estimate, uh, I would put the number at less than 0.05% of that 220,000 books. So less than around 500 or approximately in that, you could take these as orders of magnitude. And then we ask ourselves, what works were actually translated? How are they selected? Um, I look at that student looking at the, at the stacks, that's something I often used to do to figure out what I thought was important. Um, and I'm sad for myself then that I didn't um, have too many resources in terms of Arabic um, translations, but some of those old translations were fantastic. But what were they? Well, um, in 1999, I would say, at least in English, um, a large percentage would have been novels. There were, um, there's a long uh, um, tradition of uh, Orientalist scholarship um, in, uh, that we'll talk about perhaps, um, and lots of translations, many of which were valuable of early Arabic poetry up until around the 10th century. But after that, um, the interest um, died out. Uh, and we'll, we can talk about that. Um, they, they died out mainly for, I'll explain, they died out mainly for an idea called the decline thesis. Uh, this thesis was that uh, basically um, in Arabic literature, although the thesis sort of was proposed for many other uh, literatures of the East, there was a golden age. That age was the, for the, for the Arabic period, for Arabic literature was the eighth through the 10th centuries. And after that, Arabic literature became too Baroque, um, too interested in um, literary form over content, uh, too ornate. Um, and, you know, there are very various theses uh, why that was. Um, but what it meant was that the majority of the translations were of this golden age. And they asked, well, how readable were these translations? Well, back in um, 1999, um, and I first started teaching um, uh, college courses in the 2000s, really the, the translations, although there are some great exceptions to this, um, were for the most part designed to teach students of Arabic. Um, so when you read Arabic poetry, for example, it wasn't clear that you were really reading a poem that anyone else would wanna read. Now you had the Arabic in front of you, so that was kind of nice, um, but so that was kind of the state of play, if you will, um, in 1999. Um, as I said, it's a tale of two libraries. Um, in 2007, um, I went to my first, this was my first international academic conference. Um, <laughs> I was young. I, I had yet to finish my dissertation. I was lucky to be invited to uh, a conference at the Orient Institute in uh, Istanbul, very venerable institution, um, where many of the um, uh, many of the most famous uh, Orientalists uh, who had fled uh, Germany during Second World War uh, um, had lived. So they had a very interesting uh, center. But the place we that really drew my attention was this uh, this mosque library. In fact. Uh, the Suleymaniye Mosque Library. It's known in Turkish as Kutufanesi, the Suleymaniye Kutufanesi. Um, this uh, this uh, library is much older than the Regenstein Library. Um, it is named Suleymaniye after Suleyman the Magnificent, or Suleymane Kanuni, the lawgiver. Um, and it was built in the middle of the 16th century. And you might ask yourself why um, did I think this was such an amazing library? One of the most amazing libraries I had ever been to. Well, we have two images uh, on the side, apart from the beautiful gardens. Um, there are two images on the side here um, that should perhaps give you some clues. Uh, the first uh, on the top is a man restoring a manuscript. And a part of that tour I was able to 
um, visit the back room. We were we were sort of an international delegation from you know ten different countries: uh, Iran, Yemen, Israel, um, the United States, Germany, um, et cetera. So it was a big international delegation, um, and we were able to visit the the back room, as it were, of the Sudemania uh, Library. And um, you can see them restoring books. But what's most interesting is the man in the back. Um, what you can see is a process that was going on from 2002 to 2014. And what he's doing, you see the, there's a little light there. I don't know if you can kind of see it. He's actually um, digitizing a book. Now, um, you might ask yourself, well, how many books are in this library? Why is it so important? Well, this is the largest collection of digitized Arabic manuscripts in the world. Um, it's around 100,000 volumes. I think they say 120,000 volumes right now, but they're all digital. That is, you can go there, you will not open up a manuscript when you go there. You'll get, um, you'll go and you'll sit by, you can see the library, you'll sit by a computer screen. Um, but this is the largest collection of digitized manuscripts in the world. Now, you might ask yourself, okay, man, why, why is he talking about manuscripts? Manuscripts, of course, handwritten uh, um, books. Well, most of Arabic literature still remains in manuscript. In fact, um, while I don't have numbers for Arabic literature per se, because it's very hard to determine in many collections what works are even in Arabic and what are not. You can see what is in Arabic script uh, and the great uh, French codicologist uh, Ferdinand de Roche has estimated that the number of extant books in manuscript, that is, these are often unique copies, it's 4 million. Now that's Arabic script. It's not all Arabic, right? It could be Arabic script, could be Urdu, right? Um, and we know probably, we're get, we guess uh, sort of the, you know, if this is the tip of the iceberg, you can imagine the, uh, this uh, great Ottoman library is the tip of the iceberg of what um, uh, survives in, uh, from Arabic literature. Um, well, there, the iceberg includes um, uh, a little bit visible, maybe a little bit more visible is also Iran. You can still see some of those. Uh, they've done a, a remarkable job in digitizing manuscripts. But India, of course, also a vast number of of Arabic manuscripts there as well, and the rest of the world, you can find Arabic manuscripts um, from Sub-Saharan Africa to China um, and major collections in the United States and of course in the former Soviet Union. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, this is a massive uh, cache of materials. And once you start thinking about it in with a respect to the other library, it becomes kind of an interesting question. Now, I would estimate probably, um, and this is something that um, experts do over lunch. Um, I was asked this question. <laughs> we, we discussed this question at one of our um, uh, board meetings. I'll tell you about that at some point, what I mean by board meeting. Um, it was estimated that around one, point, one or two percent of the vast corpus of manuscript material has been studied, and a smaller proportion of it has actually been printed. Um, we're looking at a world um, very much like um, the literature scholar Franco Moretti has called the great unread. Um, we know actually very little about Arabic literature. Um, um, we can talk about why that is um, perhaps later. Um, uh, this is a quotation. If you don't mind, just for a second, I'm gonna pause this, this share because I have your faces in front of me and I need to um, see more of, oh, I'm not sure that I can. Okay, wait, I'll go back. Oops, well, you can read it. Let me see here. Um, Every, each one of us has control over the screen so we can enlarge your share screen icon and minimize your image. Uh, okay, you know what I would love to be able to do would actually be to um, shrink your, and the problem is I'm a little bit locked in here. Let me just see if I can do something. Ah, do I've done it. I did it. I just did it. Thank okay, you. I'm. what I'm going to do now is actually minimize. 
Uh, you couldn't see me. You couldn't see these pictures very well, could you? We I can mean, see perfectly everything, and ev we can actually play with your icon and with the share. Ah, okay, great. I see you. I see everyone else, and I see shared screen. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so why don't I? Uh, so you've been able to follow these things. Um, this is a, a quotation from my colleague uh, Thomas Bauer, one of the great um, Arabists of the uh, of our time. And he, he states, um, we live in hard times for pioneers and discoverers. There are no more blank spots on the map of our globe. There are no more undiscovered continents, no unexplored jungles and no unknown tribes to be found, but there still is Arabic literature. Um, I can't tell you how much I, um, I feel that kind of um, sense, uh, much more so when he wrote it even, uh, which was a decade ago. Um, well, those are two libraries, um, and yet um, we're not going to tour them. Um, they're almost too vast uh, uh, in some ways uh, for us to put our minds around. And um, I'm going to now take you back, well, to me uh, and a little bit of biography. Here we are on a blank screen. Um, I started uh, in 2008 teaching at New York University, uh, the one in New York. Um, at that time, um, I hadn't yet finished my dissertation. Um, and I was invited to lunch uh, by one of my colleagues, uh, Philip Kennedy, who you'll meet. And as we were crossing 7th Avenue, um, he says to me the following, and it was noisy. And as you'll see, he's British and he talks very low. Um, Morris, uh, I'm going to Abu Dhabi. There's going to be a new campus uh, there of New York University. And of course, I actually being, I've known Philip, I'd known him on and off, I'd, I'd met him in, co uh, in conferences and things. Uh, I knew he had a wry sense of uh, humor and I thought it was a joke. Until we got um, uh, across the street and um, he seemed serious. Uh, and we uh, began to talk about a project that he, uh, uh, that he said that he was going to be spearheading uh, and he wanted me uh, to be a part of. And sure enough, within days of my talking to Philip, um, I started to see, let's see if this will go forward. Will it go forward now? Okay, maybe not. Oops. Uh, I am sort of stuck here. Let's see again. Let me see if I can do something. Try to switch off share. Oh, okay, I got it. But. I saw this, um, this uh, logo, NYU Abu Dhabi. I then saw, um, I saw this uh, logo, NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, really within months, I received an invitation uh, from Philip uh, saying he had gone to Abu Dhabi and I think it was already January. Um, he invited me in March to a conference at this building here. Um, this was the temporary campus of New York University. Um, it was assembled in pieces uh, in Norway, I believe, and shipped to Abu Dhabi and assembled like something from Ikea. Um, there, uh, around 15 of the leading scholars of Arabic in the world started to dream. Um, and what were we dreaming about? Something called, at that point, we didn't even have a name uh, and uh, we'll eventually talk about it. It was the Library of Arabic Literature. We were all asked to sort of pick three titles of the titles we would want to translate. Um, it was a crazy uh, sort of experiment because you had to sort of think, 
out of these oceans of books, which ones really matter? Um, I'm proud to say that um, one of them I work on today. Um, at that time, uh, the campus of New York University had yet to be built. Um, New York University Abu Dhabi is an undergraduate campus with around 2000 students. Um, this library of Arabic literature, because it's related to the region was a signature project of the, of the university from the very beginning. Um, that's, a, that's a picture of a model of the island where we now live. Uh, in the far distance is the Guggenheim Museum, which is not built, it will be, uh, but that dome shaped building there is the Louvre, which is built. And actually you can almost see here, whoops, you can almost see here, uh, Sorry about that. You can almost see here, um, uh, here is the current campus of uh, New York University, Abu Dhabi. Um, it's quite a big space um, uh, and it's on this, this island. We can talk about that um, if you're interested later. Um, the idea that we talked about um, was given this world of libraries, whether they be the University of Chicago, Harvard, or whatever, the sort of libraries, major research libraries in the world, um, but also this world of manuscripts, what should we do? Well, we had an idea. I think all of us, uh, Philip really from the beginning, um, was his uh, passion that drove this. Um, it was to create, well, if there aren't enough translations, we make a library uh, much like the libraries of academic works that uh, preceded us. Uh, um, the, the books you see here are all of a certain type um, and they share something with the library of Arabic literature. Um, they're all uh, what are called facing page translations. On the one side is English, on the other side is uh, the original. Um, so you have a translation and the original. Um, the real uh, forefather of this, um, of this kind of type of, of book was uh, the Loeb Classical Library, which were, you can see the volume of Homer here, um, but uh, they had volumes in Greek and in Latin. Um, the volumes in Greek were green, the volumes in Latin were red, good for colorblind people like me. Um, uh, they were followed actually, um, only in the, I think in the 2000s actually, um, by the Itati series, um, which was sponsored uh, by Harvard University Press, uh, Itati being uh, affiliated with Harvard, and the Clay Sanskrit Library, which was a project run uh, by New York University Press. So there was actually a precedent uh, for this. Um, and so, um, and at that first meeting, there were members of, the, of New York University Press, and we talked about what it would take to launch one of these projects. Now, the Loeb Classical Library had been going on for a hundred years. And um, as you can see, they benefit from that history. Um, most of the works and texts, so the texts had been edited, that is people had taken Greek manuscripts and turned them into edited texts a long time ago. In fact, the tradition of doing that uh, dates to the 16th century. Uh, it's a long time. Um, and, um, and translations, of course, of these works had also, there's a long history. And in fact, the one that we're looking at here is, a, is an early 20th century translation um, reprinted in 1995. So it's not so hard. Uh, classical literature um, has roughly, much of it has been translated. Um, uh, the orders of magnitude are not even comparable. Um, I think after Chinese, Arabic is the longest uh, lasting and perhaps largest um, uh, literary tradition. We can kind of debate what I mean by that, um, but Arabic is pretty much legible from the sixth century CE until the 20th century, um, you know, like, like other languages. It's a very, very, um, you know, spoken and read over a very large um, geographical area um, really. Um, a large part of the globe for some time. This is what the Loeb Classical Library looks like. And so we were kind of inspired and we thought, well, maybe we can do that. But the idea 
you know, of really creating or recreating a canon of works like the Loeb Classical Library was almost impossible uh, for Arabic literature. It's too vast. And so the aim was really to almost attempt to reflect the large corpus of Arabic literature, to really think about what Arabic literature, you know, what was distinctive about it um, over its long history. And really, we, we were all experts from the beginning, at least in this, uh, in this early phase of the Library of Arabic Literature. And I think, still think we're in an early phase because you know, low, low classical libraries are going on since 1911, where our first book came out in 2013. So we've got a long time to go. Um, these books, as you can see them, they're all integral books. Um, they're meant, that is, we didn't select normally from, from uh, works of Arabic literature. We, we try to present them as wholes. And the, the series is meant to create books for, um, you know, for posterity. Uh, long after all of us are gone, hopefully this library will still be uh, found on some shelves, on some world, if there still are libraries. Um, this is the, uh, um, the sort of mission statement, I, could, I guess I'd call it, of the Library of Arabic Literature. You can see our, our logo is a gazelle, uh, which uh, if you don't know, Abu Dhabi means uh, uh, possessor of a gazelle. A dhabi is a gazelle. Um, my little son knows all of his animals, so he certainly knows that a dhabi is a gazelle. Um, the Library of Arabic, and I'll just read it to you. The Library of Arabic Literature makes available Arabic editions. Uh, so we turn manuscripts into editions so that can be read by modern readers. I'll explain what that means perhaps later. Uh, with an emphasis on the seventh to the 19th centuries. The Library of Arabic Literature thus includes texts from the pre-Islamic era to the cusp of the modern period and encompasses a wide range of genres, including poetry, poetics, fiction, religion, philosophy, law, science, travel writing, history, and historiography. Um, I apologize from the outset that we will not tour all of these places. Uh, um, I, I'm mainly going to focus on either works that I've somehow been involved with or ones that I, I feel a certain uh, kinship to. Um, and I am almost always the, um, the literature fellow that is Belle Lettres, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, so what is Arabic literature? Um, so the Arabic term adab um, roughly means literary cultivation. Um, and it came, I think, to mean Belle Lettres in the 19th century under the impact of European ideas and translations. It meant something larger and much broader in the past. Um, and I guess um, we'll leave it at that because in many ways, the Library of Arabic Literature, the very way that it embraces a wide range of modern genres, including poetry, poetics, fiction, religion, philosophy, law, science, travel writing, history, and historiography, I think would not be so foreign to um, a, an adib, that would mean a practicer of adab, that would mean someone who knew literature back in the 10th century. On the side um, there, this image, this lovely image is um, uh, a drawing by Dia El Azawi, um, an artist of one of the great uh, odes, uh, which we will talk about soon but I like it as a visual presentation of an attempt to capture Arabic literature, almost you know, uncapturable, I guess, in some ways, um, to strike you visually. Uh, and I think the visuality, uh, the, um, this, this, uh, this print immediate, immediately, when I saw it, I thought it was something I, I should share with you. Um, one of the goals of the series from the very beginning was to produce readable English translations. Um, the series was reviewed, uh, you know, each of the volumes has been reviewed count, you know, many, many times in different journals around the world. Um, this comes from the Times Literary Supp Supplement uh, from the UK. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, I think, gratifying to hear fresh high quality editions. Um, it's a real challenge to both uh, be, as translators talk about 
be faithful and what even faithful means, uh, um, but also be lively and interesting for people. Um, it's, I'm still, I still have learned, I, I still keep learning what um, these, the word readable means, uh, I think I, um, and whether it is in fact the, um, the most desirable of, of attributes of a text, of a translation. Um, I'm gonna now just um, uh, hand you over to my colleague, Philip Kennedy, who I told you about. Um, he'll give you a first reading uh, from the consorts of the caliphs. I chose this to start, and I'm sure that Philip put it on the website um, years ago as an introduction to what the series does, because it was a joint project. Um, I actually worked with Philip on the section um, uh, uh, that uh, um, we contributed to this, um, to this volume. Uh, there are around 13 people who worked on this, uh, on this uh, volume in a hotel suite in Abu Dhabi. Oh, now, gosh, eight, nine years ago. So I'll hand it to Philip to talk about it. If Consorts это собственно жены. This author was a librarian at a time when in fact Abbasid culture was thriving, but it's a time we know little about. The problem uh, with this time is that he lived on the eve of the Mongol destruction of Baghdad. So it's a very important anecdote, a very important document of that period. He collected 38 anecdotes about important women consorts, that is, wives, slaves, concubines of important men. Consorts of caliphs were, were the consorts of the rich and powerful, both from the period of Harun al-Rashid, that's the ninth century, the great golden age of Abbasid culture, when a lot of women such as those that are described in this book, bested men in poetry, actually in poetic competitions. So I'm reading from chapter three, Inan, the daughter of, of Abdullah. Her name probably means something like restraint, something of a nickname. And she was the slave of one Anatafi, about whom we know not much, but we know that it means, I believe it's the seller of brittle nut bars. Inan was the first poet to become famous under the Abbasids and the most gifted poet of her generation. The major male poets of the time would seek her out in her master's house where they would recite her verses to her and have her pass judgment. When her master died, Inan was freed either because he had bequeathed her freedom in his will or because she had borne him a child. Citing sources going back to Marwan ibn Abi Hafsa, Abu Faraj al-Isfahani in his great book of songs, so the, one of the great compilations of Arabic literature, reports that Marwan said, one day I ran into a Natafi who invited me to come and meet him, meet Inan. We went to his house and he entered her room ahead of me saying, look, I brought you the greatest poet of all, Marwan ibn Abi Hafsa. Inan was not feeling well and said, I have other things than Marwan to worry about right now. A Natafi struck her with his whip and called out to me, come in. I entered and found her weeping. Seeing her tears, I extemporized. Inan weeps tears that scattered like a broken string of pearls. She immediately responded with, may the tyrant's right arm wither as his cruel whip unfurls. If any man or jinn alive is a greater poet than she, I will free every single slave I own, I said to Anatafi. If you want to know more about this project, um, you can find it online. I can send you all um, the link. Um, you can see um, it's affiliated with NYU Press. Um, our books now, um, uh, we're, I believe, at 60 some odd books, 60 some odd titles. Um, you can find more out about the series. Um, 
the people um, were on our second iteration of the board. Um, we have professors from the Ohio State University, University of Pennsylvania, Princeton, NYU Abu Dhabi, American University of Beirut. This is my co-author and best friend from the American University uh, of Beirut and NYU Abu Dhabi uh, and Carleton University here uh, in Canada. Um, our prior board included the uh, professors from here, uh, NYU, uh, the chair of Arabic at Cambridge, uh, the chair of Oriental, uh, the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures at uh, Yale University, um, the current Laudian professor at Oxford, um, and Chicago, Emory, UPenn, et cetera. Um, so kind of uh, um, the leading scholars, at least from the UK and the US, uh, mainly because it's an Eng English language translation uh, project. Um, Let's see. So I will go back to um, uh, if there are any questions right now, I can take some about this presentation. And if not, I can move along to actually exploring this library. We've just looked at the covers um, and heard something from the general editor. Let's explore. Let's... Okay, let's explore. Uh, the first place I think um, uh, that we can sort of our first exploration should be really to the past. Um, and I entitled this first section, Damn the Ruins, uh, Poetry from Arabia in the Sixth Century CE. first encountered an Arabic poem uh, in 1982. I can remember it um, uh, very vividly. Uh, it was um, April, uh, and I sat with a big pile of dictionaries um, and the book open in front of me, uh, and I tried to read it. I'd only been studying, studying Arabic since October, so this was only six or seven months later. Um, I think of maybe the three out of the 600 words that I understood, they got me really excited. Uh, I didn't know what this poetry was, where it came from, what the voice was. I had nothing to compare it to. And it was one of those uh, uh, moments of revelation. يا منشدين الحي حي وحينا وإحنا هنا على العهد دائما مخلصين. It is extremely important in the Arabic speaking world. If you're a student of Arabic um, and you really want to talk to an Arab and understand the cultural values, the aspirations, the 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 the, the the things that, that you, the Arab you're, you're talking to will respect, poetry is the thing you need to have. So what I think will happen in the journey is that you leave these big ideas like the West, Islam, all these other grand uh, concepts that tend to be brought into the discussion. And you can get to hear the voice of people from six, seven, eight hundred years ago, uh, talking, living, breathing. Uh, and that's not a bad thing, because if there's anything which is going to make the situation worse, it's a continued inability to communicate. And I think that Arabic poetry can offer us just a different way of thinking about how important communication is. موريتانيا الشاعر رقم أربعة مصعب بيروتية من سوريا الشاعر رقم خمسة 
مناهي الفتح من السودان مذ أورقت فكرة في روحه Okay, let's see if I can move forward here. Um, that uh, um, presentation uh, was meant to sort of suggest that uh, um, Arabic poetry is still very much uh, alive today uh, and very much um, something uh, um, very fundamental to what it is to be um, a speaker of the Arabic language. Um, the world uh, of the poetry that I'm going to tell you about today um, is the Arabian Peninsula. Um, you might think of the Arabian Peninsula as being, you know, pretty, uh, <laughs> uh, let's say, a place that was, uh, it's very much in world politics today. Um, back in the, uh, in the seventh century, uh, when this poetry was first composed, it was also a world, it was also, um, central to politics, because it stood right between uh, the Byzantine Empire and the Persian Empire. And in fact, uh, many of the tribal groups were either clients of one or the other. It was not a completely illiterate environment as many people imagine, although this poetry was composed orally. There are plenty of inscriptions that are now being studied from Arabia. This is a place with writing. Um, there was a great impact already um, of monotheisms. Uh, uh, you might know, of course, this is the, the birthplace of Islam, but in, um, in Mecca, of course, there were Jewish uh, tribes uh, on the coast in the, in the, whether you call it the Arab Gulf or the Persian Gulf, uh, there were Christians, um, there were Zoroastrians, and there were Jews in Saudi Arabia, um, a Jewish kingdom even in Saudi Arabia. So lots of different uh, groups. Um, the poetry of Antara actually takes place in the Najd, which is the um, area that's within today, the highlands, you can see it in the center of this map of um, Northern Arabia. Um, so if you see it there. Um, Poetry in Arabic um, is not making like it is in the Greek tradition and throughout the West, that's poesis. But rather in poetry, the poet is a knower and we might ask what a poet actually knows. Well, one thing that scholars know about Arabic poetry is that it was composed orally. That is poets actually uh, came up with their poetry by and in the spur of the moment often. Um, and they were moved to do that, um, to commemorate uh, important events, often battles or important events in the life of the tribe. Poetry was about memory in a semi-literate semi environment. Um, this poetry was only recorded in writing in the eighth century um, in Iraq. So in a different place uh, really um, and far removed. Um, but I think there are elements of it that really ring true. Uh, having lived now in the desert, uh, <laughs> I can tell you there are features of this poetry um, that actually are very much uh, akin to some of the modern oral poetry of Arabia, um, which is composed today in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi and all along the, uh, the Persian uh, Gulf or the Arabian Gulf, whichever one you wanna say. Um, one thing I would like to tell you is that Arabic poems are called at least one major uh, genre, the genre from pre-Islamic Arabia is called the Qasida. Um, and this Qasida is in three parts. It begins with a lament over a lost uh, beloved, that is a beloved who has traveled to a different place and one uh, sits and moans by the campsite. Then the poet goes on a journey, that's a travel section. And then the poet returns to boast of his conquest, of his pride in himself. Um, this tripartite pattern um, has been, uh, scholars have thought of it, especially the uh, famed uh, 
scholar Yaroslav Stetkevich as a rite of passage. That is, the poet loses love, thinks about the transience of the world, and goes on a travel, and then finally returns a man. He goes from boyhood to manhood. Um, the great poems of, uh, of the Arabic tradition, especially from the pre-Islamic, well, the greatest poems of the pre-Islamic tradition are called Mu'allaqat. We call them the golden odes. They're very long poems. They were held up, um, it's said at the time, but probably in the eighth century, finally, as showpieces of the greatest pre-Islamic Arabic poets. The volume I'm gonna talk about today um, is called War Songs, the man who you heard, I hope, uh, speaking. His name was uh, the translator, James Montgomery, who's the chair of Arabic at um, uh, Cambridge University. Um, War Songs is one of the first uh, times, I think, that a translation uh, for Arabic poetry, you can judge for yourself, is come out as a readable translation. Um, well, who is this poet, Antara ibn Shaddad? Antara, uh, from the moment in the third, ninth century that Antara appears, um, he's sort of a figure that we only learn about later. His poetry is there, but as he appears, he's cloaked in uncertainty, having already become the stuff of legend. There are, however, points where all the versions of the legend converge. Antara was black. He was born a slave to a black mother, herself a slave, and he belonged to the tribe of Abs. And he lived in the second half of the sixth century. And he was a most ferocious and accomplished writer. Um, and he won his freedom in battle, and he excelled it as a poet. Well, rather than um, have you listen to James, um, who's got a lovely uh, Glasgow, Glas um, Glasgowian accent, um, you'll have to settle for me. I'll read the opening lines of this poem, which are the lament of the beloved. Did poetry die in its war with the poets? Is this where Abla walked? Think. The ruins were deaf, refused to reply, then shouted out in a foreign tongue. So did poetry die in its war with the poets? Is this where Abla walked? Abla is his lover, her beloved. Think, the ruins were deaf, refused to reply, then shouted out in a foreign tongue. My camel tried to withdraw. I couldn't move, ranting at the charred stones. Speak, live, prosper. Here in Jiwa, Abla dwelled, a timid gazelle, doe eyes, sweet smile, soft, soft neck. I'm going to read the Arabic now, at least the first line, so you can get a sense for this as poetry. Um, the poetry is in monorhyme, that is, it rhymes in a me, me. If you listen to that, the vowel, the, the consonant and vowel me. And um, one other feature is that it has meter. And I'll, I'll read it out to you so that you can first, just as one would read it in Arabic, and then accentuating the meter a little bit. Um, if you notice, it's, you can clap it out actually. Um, this meter is called camo. It has, um, it's notable, you'd immediately know for three short beats in a row. Um, so um, that's the meter, that's the rhyme. Um, but how do you make this poetry work for a modern audience? How do you make this sing? Um, I give you another poem. I actually worked on the translation of this poem um, with James Montgomery um, uh, back 10 years ago. Uh, 
this poem, I don't think it's not in a tripartite. It's not about a poet um, talking about loss per se, but actually sort of questioning the entire tradition of poetry. And he says, damn the ruins, damn you, stop dwelling on the past again. Damn you, stop all this talk. You won't ever get the sweet times back. At El Farouk, we shielded our women, trampled the locusts underfoot when the armies collided. No retreat we swore, we swore. Our spears are from Rodena, hard iron to make you whine like dogs at the sight of vipers. You bolted, rumps in the air like old camels sniffing a corpse. Couldn't you see our spears protect us? You're not going to drool over our soft necked gazelles. Still, time takes us all. Death appeared. I said to my men, who's up for a wager? Who'll face death with me? Turn your horses, the raiders are here. Don't let them win the prize. They met warriors, not slaves at El Farouk. We drive our horses hard, their manes matted like lice-ridden hair. Come back for more now that you know, time damns us all. Um, I'd like to just point out that the damn the ruins stop dwelling on the past again is about those poets, the poet, the figure of the poet who would go to the campsites. Stop thinking about the past. The battle is now. Um, Antara is a warrior. Um, and it's very interesting, the figure of the warrior poet. Um, he's a warrior also that be believes in the power of fate and time. Um, this is poetry that comes before Islam. Uh, for Antara, meaning is battle. Meaning is war. Meaning is the dance with death. Um, it's ironic, of course, a warrior poet, a dance with death, a warrior poet. I mean, in the end, of course, um, you know, probably if he was a real hero, he would have died in battle. But uh, Antara is always telling us about his great, great conquests. Um, if you notice, actually, uh, or I'll explain it to you, in the first line is the word Allah, uh, God in Arabic. Allah um, Damn the ruins, damn you. Notice we did not translate, actually, um, the word God uh, there, uh, because it's an expression. Um, it, it just... For us, it's may God, may God make perish um, these, uh, these ruins. The next stop on our tour, um, I'd like to take you to uh, the poetry of Abu Nuwes. So eighth century Baghdad. Um, this is often thought of as a golden period um, in Arabic literature. I've told you a little bit about the problems with that. As an idea. Maurice, Maurice yeah. may I ask a question? Sure. So it's right here. Uh, Antora is a poet or is he a hero in this poetry? He is both. Okay. So he is always telling us about his conquests. Yes. Okay. But earlier, I think, I think that you said that the, that poetry of that period was about a poet telling about his conquest of his pride. How his, the, how his do you of his, of his pride. pride? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I misunderstood you. Uh, uh, it's no. It's it's I actually not know. conquest of pride, but actually a demonstration of pride. Is very uh -huh. common part of this. Um, even oh. here in this poem, he's very proud. Um, uh, you, they met warriors, not slaves. He's saying he's talking about his own uh, um, the, the valor of his men um, and the, ca the cowardice of his opponents. Okay, uh, so it's not about humility, it's more about. Oh, no, absolutely the opposite. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes. 
Um, he, he is saying time damns us all, but actually, uh, you know, it's better to, better to die a hero uh, would be Antara's view. Better to die a hero. Um, death appeared, I would believe in this poem, refers to Antara. He talks about himself as death. Um, he's that kind of figure, um, very, uh, very brave. Um, if you look at the poem, you know, look, look at it, he's sort of saying, stop all you poets with your poetic talk. Stop dwelling on the past. Damn you. You know, your memory will mean nothing, actually. This is a very ironic thing to say by a poet. Uh, um, stop all this talk. You won't get the sweet times back. In fact, the reality of sort of man and woman is at Farouk, we shielded our women, we protected our honor, and we trampled the locusts underfoot when the armies collided. Basically, he's referring to the enemies as locusts. No retreat, we swore. Our spears are tougher than yours. They're hard iron to make you whine like dogs at the sight of vipers. You will be like animals, like children. You, will, you, were, you are worse, you are like dogs. You bolted you know, rumps in the air. You fled like, like cowards, like old camels sniffing a corpse. Couldn't you see our spears protect us? You're not going to drool over our women. I mean, it's a very, I mean, I think there's pride there of the, about, about the honor uh, of his uh, tribe. And yet at the end of all of that boasting, he'll say, time takes us all. It's very interesting, actually. You know, this is not uh, very much counter to Islamic notions. Um, and it's interesting because early Muslims recorded this poetry. Um, we owe its preservation to them. Death appeared, I said to my men, who's up for a wager? That is, battle was the great wager. Will you win? Will you lose? You know, um, will you die? Will you, be on, will you face dishonor? Who will face death with me? Turn your horses, the raiders are here. Don't let them win the prize. They, meaning the enemy, met warriors, not slaves at Al Farouk. We drive our horses hard, their manes matted like lice ridden hair. Come back for more, he says to the enemy, it's a taunt. Now that you know, time damns us all. You come to me. It's a very, it's a very powerful um, uh, uh, poem. It's a very different spirit, um, I think, um, that uh, later on. I mean, one could argue that this poetry was preserved because it comes from the time of the Quran and many of the words there were used in pre-Islamic poetry were used by later scholars to understand rare Quranic words, uh, words in, of revelation, that's true. Um, but I think also there's a spirit of a martial spirit, a persona, which is very important. And, and I think for the first time, at least in English, um, I see it in this translation being communicated. Um, the next stop on our tour should be 8th century Baghdad. Um, and we'll meet a poet. Here's Abbasid Baghdad. Um, it was a round city uh, planned by the Caliph Al Mansur in the middle of the 8th century. There are some folks drinking wine. People drank wine in Abbasid uh, Baghdad at the court. In fact, there's a long tradition of wine poetry uh, that. Uh, uh, goes back to pre-Islamic period and well through all periods of Arabic literature. People not only drank wine, um, they wrote poetry about it. Um, this is Abu Nuwes, who we call the bad boy of Baghdad. Um, uh, he, he was, uh, um, uh, he lived um, in, and died in the, in the early ninth century. His great achievement was bringing together wine poetry and erotic poetry, um, which are called ghazals. The wine poetry is called khamriya. Um, his collection of poetry is famed for its homoeroticism, um, and yet it includes love poetry for both genders. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, he created a new style of Arabic poetry called badia. Uh, in which metaphors act like a code. Um, this has persisted throughout Arabic poetry until the 20th, 20th century. It even informs modern pop songs. Um, if you say, I saw a moon, 
uh, in Arabic literature or Persian literature or Urdu literature or Turkish literature, it means I saw a boy with a round face. Um, and modern editions of his poetry have often been bowdlerized. That means people have taken away uh, the, the words that they find offensive, uh, and yet the poetry is quite beautiful. I'll read one of the poems. Uh, this is translated by uh, Hert, Hertian van Helder, um, who was the former uh, professor at Oxford. Um, this is called, On a Boy Called Ali. It's a homoerotic poem. You who play with my life, who shun me and play hard to get, you who are stingy with your trysts and make my enemies gloat, taking my heart away from me, planted on a lance tip, and who unjustly has confined my passion to my soul, unable to speak it. This is a letter meant for you. My tears are its ink. Its contents are my heart's, my heart's yearning for you, myself laid open. If only you would hear my excuse or accept my innocence. My sleepless eyes would not observe the rising stars. Your peerless novelty is beyond description. Your face is the full moon. Here it is, the new style. Your face is a full moon. Your eyes of desert gazelles, uniquely blessed among those gazelles that explore meadows in winter or summer pastures. Frail of frame, near falling, slender in neck. Here's where it gets interesting. You have the body of a boy, though you flirt like a girl. Male in appearance, female in private. Locks like a pretty girl with, with curls and ringlets, above smooth cheeks, lighting the dark, and a mustache starting to sprout. That is the one I shall not name, for res I respect my friends. But when I can take it no more, I mention him by spelling out his name. An A, an L, an I. Such a sweet sound they make. This is his talking to his beloved. Um, my students often, uh, one student recently said, it was here in, you know, you have the boy body of a boy, though you flirt like a, a girl, that male in your appearance, female in private, that um, this student said, this is where, you know, Abu Nawaz makes a great stir that, you know, he's, his beloved was a male. Uh, actually, this would not have shocked uh, audiences in, uh, uh, in ninth century Baghdad at all. Uh, in fact, actually the dominant form of Arabic poetry was homoerotic throughout the, uh, the tradition. Uh, there are reasons for some of this. Uh, some of it was out of, um, uh, uh, to this day, uh, pop music is often addressed in, to the masculine uh, pronoun even when uh, the beloved is clearly a female. Um, that is a way, it's a way of showing in, in one case, respect. Uh, and in fact, actually what's going on in this poem is very interesting. Uh, it's actually a letter. He says, uh, he's writing his beloved. This is a letter meant for you. My tears, it's ink. It's contents, my heart's yearning, right? He talks about his suffering love. And then he, he describes what's so beautiful about this boy, Ali. And it's actually about how he cannot name his beloved, and yet he will. There's a very interesting pose. Um, this goes back to a story that perhaps some of you know. Um, it's a very famous story in Arabic and Persian, Majnun Leila about the lover, Majnun, who's the madman, who loves Layla, his beloved, so much, uh, but the tribe won't have him, uh, Layla's tribe. Um, they won't marry him to Layla, and so he goes mad. Um, the idea of a, a poet or a lover voicing the name of the beloved is somewhat of a taboo. Abu Nuwas is the bad boy of Baghdad. He likes to break taboos. Um, he, uh, it, in contrast to Antara, who's the poet as a warrior, you could call Abu Nuwas the poet almost as the court jester. He liked to play. 
Um, the next poem I'm going to talk to you about is another poem of Abu Nowas. Um, or if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take them about that. I know I've sort of said some, I think, hopefully provocative, interesting things. My, my gosh, I do have a question. Sure. I'm not versed in Quran. So here is a question. If wine was wine drinking was so accepted and respected that poetry genre was created about wine drinking and wine, mm -hmm. if homoeroticism shared the same honor as wine, why later prohibitions? Um, well, in terms of wine, the prohibition was there uh, in the Quran very, uh, well, one could say in the first place, well, wine, it's not wine necessarily that's prohibited, it's drunkenness. And so um, Muslim jurists would just define drunkenness in very interesting ways. Um, some of the jurists at the court of the Abbasids would define drunkenness in the following way. Drunkenness is the inability to distinguish, and this is kind of ironic, up or down, male or female. If you, if you were that drunk, that's what drunkenness was. Everything else, and as long as the substance didn't cause that, well, then it was licit. Um, this was, of course, uh, and now today, uh, uh, one would call it a, a probably a minority opinion. Uh, it was held by Hanafi jurists, so it's a particular uh, group of jurists. The Quran itself is only a source of Islamic judgments. It's not the total, total sum of, of um, uh, it's probably too complex to go into right now, but long story short, um, not all jurists uh, prohibited wine drinking uh, uh, and certainly wine drinking was done um, and it was done by the caliph. And of course, religious scholars, um, many of them objected and found this offensive, but nonetheless, it was still done. Um, uh, as for homoeroticism and, and you know, um, male, male love, um, well, certainly it went on. Uh, um, it was certainly a part of that, that world. Um, and uh, um, there are definitely prohibitions against that uh, and lots of sexual acts that we know went on. And Abu Nawas's poetry, um, it was patronized by the caliphs. Now he kind of, I think the models, perhaps you can look to, I don't know, um, the you know the ancien regime you know sort of the 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 absolutist regimes in France breaking the rules in front of the ruler is often a really powerful thing um, that the ruler that sort of enhances the ruler's reputation um, he can allow sort of the illicit in front of him occasionally he would jail Abu Nuwas he got jailed a couple of times but um, uh, I see another question I don't know if I fully answered that I mean it, it was something that certainly went on. Um, the Quran actually doesn't, uh, in terms of, um, it's not the Quran that it prohibits um, uh, 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 homo homoerotic acts. Um, you'll find that uh, elsewhere. Um, but then again, uh, um, it's quite clear that um, the love poetry as poetry was uh, very well esteemed. That's all I can say. Um, so I see an, another another question. I see Alex and Zina Henken. Yeah. Yes, uh, a similar question. Uh, uh, the author is describing uh, the physical appearance of the of the woman. Yes. Uh, when did um, actually a prohibition for a woman, especially unmarried, especially unmarried woman, to cover her face came? And is it the same similar to what you are describing? Yes, it was not allowed, but yes was kind of allowed? Well, you know, uh, the question of, of covering faces is a very, uh, you know, one of the most, uh, um, I think, uh, fraught ones, of course. Uh, 
Um, we know that I can only speak to certain, like I could speak to the this question at the Abbasid court. Um, when did women start to uh, start to really disappear from public view? Now, it's very interesting because it's not that women disappeared from public view. Often it's the, um, the high status wives of powerful men um, started to disappear. And um, however, the courts often um, clearly had dancers and professional uh, singers and poetesses who were unveiled and who knew more poems than the men and entertained them and were thought to be very dangerous and very powerful, like something like almost rock stars of that era. Um, that book, The Consorts of the Caliphs, will tell you about certain poetesses who it's reputed they knew, certainly they knew more poems than the men could, were, were very much their rivals. Um, and, and, you know, um, the sort of more, I would say, moralistic uh, writers said they were a real danger, um, that they posed a real threat to the men who went to these places. Um, veiling, however, as a practice, you know, um, long predates the Abbasid period. Um, we know it, it, it was a, it's said that actually uh, women in, you know, if you look at the period of early, the early Islamic period, some of the major combatants in battles are women who appear to be unveiled, or at least, you know, they never talk about being covered that, you know, sometimes it'll be like, I saw Aisha's face, um, you know, uh, the questions of, of uh, and they're, you know, certainly active uh, participants, they're driving camels around. So, you know, they're certainly um, out in the world. Um, you know, when did, you know, were some uh, uh, people veiled in, in the early Islamic period? Yes, absolutely. Um, so it really depends upon, I think, uh, in some ways, the uh, um, you know uh, practices were were uh, probably less uniform than um, the later tradition lets you know wants us to believe. Like like many many religious traditions are like that. Um, um, Maurice, one more question. Sure. Uh, if there were poets and poetesses, and poetesses were powerful mm. and courageous, probably more mm. courageous than men, uh, when it comes to homoeroticism, did women compose poetry about uh, their women lovers? For, well, we know about there, there, are, there are examples of it, not from the Abbasid period, but there are examples of it. Yes, um, there are women who wrote poems about about uh, female beloveds. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there are, the problem is, is that, um, you know, there's a there's a, uh, you know, it's very hard to know kind of at what, you know, uh, Abu Nuwas's poetry is quite on, you know, is of a, of a a feel that's while it's he's a very strong poet who basically determined I think the course of Arabic poetry for a very long time. His poetry is unusual because it's very graphic. Um, mm -hmm. He will really describe um, acts, um, sexual acts, uh, um, and that's not. It's it's somewhat unusual in the tradition, um, and so you know uh, just. You know, but displays of love, um, both between and across genders, are very, are very, are, were, were not uncommon. You know, so um, yeah, there are examples of that. Um, um, I, I guess I'll, I'll, um, I'll turn to this poem of Abu Nuwas because I think it shows something about translation as well, um, and I think it suggests something. Um, these are very, the last couple of translations I've showed you are very traditional, um, done by uh, Professor von Helder. Um, this this uh, poem is called, well, I mean, it, they don't really have titles, but it's, uh, we know it as uh, Don't Cry for Leila, uh, La Tabki Leila. Uh, Do not cry for Leila, don't rave about him, but drink among roses a rose red wine a draft that is a drink that descends in the drinker's throat 
bestowing its redness on eyes and cheek. So the red wine creates redness in the eyes and the cheeks. This line, this next line you should pay attention to. The wine is a ruby, the glass is a pearl, served by the hand of a slim figured girl who serves you the wine from her hand and wine from her mouth, doubly drunk for sure you will be, will you be. Thus I am drunk twice, my friends only once, a favor special for me alone. Should I read? I'll read the Arabic actually here. La tabki leila, la tatrab ila hindi, washrab ala alwardi min hamra'a kalwardi, ka'san ida in hadarat fi halqi sharibiha, ahadatu hamratuha, hamrataha, fil aini wal haddi, fil hamr yakutatun, wal ka'su lo'atun min kafi jariatin mamshuka til haddi. Tasqiqa min yadiha khamran wa min thamiha khamran wa ma laka min sukhrayni min buddi. Li nashwatani wa linidmani wahidatun shay'un khusistu bihi min dunihim wahdi. Um, the most interesting thing here uh, I don't know if any of you catch this as you're reading the English poetry. I'll read it again, see if you can hear it. Don't cry for Layla, don't rave about Hind, but drink among roses a rose-wed wine, a draft that descends in the drinker's throat, bestowing its redness on eyes and cheeks. The wine is a ruby, the glass is a pearl, served by the hand of a slim-figured girl. Now, um, if I'm an English poetry reader and I read a line like that, the wine is a ruby, the glass is a pearl, served by the hand of a slim figured girl. I say, what is Professor von Helder doing? This is horrible. You know, it's just a sort of sing-songy mishmash. Uh, um, it's in perfect meter, isn't it? We normally don't do that in uh, free verse translations these days. Why does he suddenly insert meter into this uh, poem? who serves you the wine from her hand and wine from her mouth, doubly drunk for sure will you be. Thus I am drunk twice, my friends only once, a favor special for me alone. Well, this line in the middle is a very important line in this poem because it, it shows you the code of the poem. The wine is a ruby. So when I say ruby to you in this context of Abu Nawasian poetry, I mean wine. When I say pearl to you, I mean glass. He's highlighted this uh, line this way because in Arabic, the poem fits the meter perfectly at that point. Abu Nuwas is doing something in this poem. This is a poem about poetry, actually. It's not about, right now we think it's a poem about drinking wine, right? Most of you thought that. I would imagine all of you thought that. It's a poem about drinking wine and how nice it is to drink wine from a beautiful woman, right? I'm going to suggest something else in translation now, a different way of translating this poem, a, a way that actually um, imagines what Abu Nawas was up to. And you can translate differently. So. Um, if you know, look at the note, Layla and Hind are traditional girls' names, and Abu Nuwes often mocks traditional Arabic poetry. So he's talking about illicit or somewhat illicit love or all kinds of different kinds of love. He's kind of a jester. He's talking about wine drinking. And then I think he's making fun of the tradition of Antara, this tradition of pre-Islamic poetry in this poem. And really what that first line says to me is enough. There are too many poems mourning beloveds, mourning the, the, the lover who has moved on from her, from her campsite. Let's write a different kind of poem is what he's saying to us. And his poem says, it begins with an observation. Wine, which is red, makes cheeks red and it makes eyes red, a problem. If wine equals a ruby and a cup equals a pearl and a girl equals a girl, 
what does ruby plus pearl plus girl equal? Solution, red wine plus red eye equals two, two X red plus Y. Here Y must equal the poet's insight. Therefore, my companions can only get drunk once and I find other powerful sources of intoxication. Um, it's a different way of translating uh, poetry. Uh, um, that's, that's my own translation um, after reading Professor von Felder's uh, first start. What I mean to do by doing that is to show that actually translation, you can sometimes translate the words, you can sometimes translate the meter, you can sometimes translate the rhyme, and that can substitute for the poem, you know, the poem in Arabic in English, but sometimes you could translate the meaning and you can, uh, and in fact, what you're doing is you're not substituting, you're finding something that is, is that you can bring across. Um, you're finding perhaps something, uh, something that uh, is on the level of meaning. Um, I wonder uh, if you'd like to if you'd like to talk about this translation or um, if you have any questions. Or yes. We are on time. Uh, yes. My question to you, Morris, is what gave you a clue that there was a code in this poem? Well, we we know that um, uh, this it's it's a way I like to describe um, this uh, Abbasid poetry. Um, it, it worked. Um, the poetry of this time, much more so than the, the time of the pre-Islamic period, poetry of the Abbasid period, um, many other poets start using Abu Nuwas's terms. Uh, in fact, this code that I talk about, Moonface, to this day, um, in I could quote Egyptian pop music, where you say, I saw a moon, you know, or you Moonface beloved, it's all over um, Arabic music. Actually, if I often when I'm teaching, I have students from all over the world in Abu Dhabi. Um, if I were to say this to a student who know, knew Urdu or Persian or Turkish, if I said Bedr, which is the word for full moon, they immediately know it means face. In fact, it's so much of a code, it's not even a code. I, I am sure you can kind of think of examples of that. This is the poetic tradition. Um, and, and Arabic and Persian and Turkish and Urdu, uh, forever after, there wasn't, this code didn't exist before Abu Nuwas, but forever after became a part of poetic poets, sort of, mm, you know, the, the way they crafted their poetry. Um, so that was, in some ways, I'm just making, making plain what is, um, what is actually, I think, Abu Nuwas's genius. Um, he, in some ways, someone had to invent this code, and I put my money on Abu Nuwas and his circle, absolutely, as the people who invented it. Um, so that's kind of why I did it. Um, it was it was almost frustration, actually, at teaching uh, Professor von Helder's uh, beautiful translation, where students would come away sort of thinking it was about love, and I very well knew it was about poetry, because most poems at their root are almost always about poetry. Um, it's what poems do. Um, so that's uh, an example of, and I called it an Ars Poetica in red, and Ars Poetica, of course, is a, is a, a poem about poetry. Um, so that was the insight. I hope it's, it's you know, uh, translation is often about um, insight. And I think the nice part about this, uh, the series and one of the challenges of it, when you're the first person to translate something, um, there's a great burden actually to be very quote unquote faithful or accuracy. Often there's substitution and you see it in the old translations of Greek and Latin. Um, in Arabic, uh, we don't have a long tradition to look back on uh, Arabic into English. Uh, often we're the first people to translate these poems. Therefore, um, you know, it's a great privilege to sort of lean, in this case, on, on a, a very excellent scholar and sort of try and think of a new, um, some, some dimension that I think his translation was perhaps missing or didn't 
or didn't or didn't itself uh, he he wasn't thinking in that way. So you know we can differ. Translation is of course interpretation. Um, I'd like to. Um, are there any other questions about this or questions in general? I know we've talked about a lot of different things. No, we can move on, I guess. Okay. I don't know. Tell me how we're doing on time. This is one of the longest yeah, doing I've ever done. Oh my God. No, no, go on as long okay. as you can. Um, the, uh, the next work um, is one, uh, it's, called, it's entitled The Philosopher Responds. Um, this work uh, comes from um, Tehran didn't exist in the 10th century. The city was called Rai, but since many of you won't, if I wrote Rai 10th century CE, you wouldn't know. So it's now modern day, where modern day Tehran is, that's where this work comes from. Um, by that time, it had become a major, um, uh, a very important city um, rivaling Baghdad. Um, you can see it on the map, Rai, it's right in the middle of the map straight in the middle. Um, the Islamic world was, well, um, when we moved from, you know, the poetry of Antara to Abu Nuwas, Arabic was suddenly, that code started to sort of creep into poetry and poetry became more, I would say, almost accessible and readable. Um, the Abbasid period, because Arabic was becoming the language of a massive empire. Uh, and this story of Arabic becoming part of a massive cosmopolitan empire um, is something that um, continues in our next work um, because big empires um, and certainly the, uh, the Abbasids were a massive empire. Uh, the Abbasid uh, Caliphate uh, in the 10th century encompassed a very large part of um, uh, until its decline in the middle of that, in the earlier part of that century, um, it stretched all the way from Egypt to Afghanistan. Uh, um, the period we're going to talk about now, it was kind of, well, falling apart a bit, a little bit, but was, you know, things were going to regroup later. Um, it was a period of devolution before a, 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 even a more, a more uh, tightly bound uh, a period later. Um, in this period, um, uh, we have a wonderful work uh, that I was very uh, happy to work on, uh, which represents the philosophical tradition um, in, um, in Arabic. Um, but it's not a usual book, actually, um, of philosophy. It's not like reading um, something very dry. Um, actually, it's two scholars who are having a well, I think what happened was one of them wrote a series of questions to the other and challenged him to answer them. And the questions are not normal. Well, they're wonderful questions because the author is my favorite author. His name is Abu Hayyana Tawhidi. He was a great scholar. I could tell you, I could talk to you about him until tomorrow. But um, we're not going to do that. In fact, we'll just listen to his voice. That's much better. Abu Hayyan's questions for which he wanted um, answers, and mind you, this is a te text from the 10th century. These are the questions he asks. Why is laughter contagious? I just asked my daughter that actually. Uh, and she said, yes, it is, daddy, it is contagious. She tried to give an answer to it. Why do mountains exist? Why do we long for the past, even if it is scarred by suffering? I know Abu Hayyan well, the question asker, and by the way, his biography was scarred by suffering. <laughs> Spanning a vast array of subjects that range from the philosophical to the theological, from philological to the scientific, the philosopher responds is a record of a set of questions put by this Abu Hayyan to a philosopher, uh, Abu Ali Miskaway. Um, and, um, you know, it goes from everything to why are the seas salty to why do, there's a wonderful section on stage fright, actually. Why do we feel bad? Oh, first, why do we feel stage fright? Like, why does a preacher in front of, a, um, in front of an audience feel stage fright? And then why do we feel bad is the next question. Why do we feel bad for the preacher in front of the audience? Which I think is an absolutely brilliant question. Um, the questions are magnificent. Um, 
Uh, and so I'll just give you a sense of, this is how he asked the question. So unwise, this is what I was talking about with my daughter. On why seeing someone laughing causes others to laugh. We sometimes see a person laughing at some remarkable thing he sees or hears or thinks of, and then another person sees him and begins to laugh at his laughter without sharing in the object of his laughter. And sometimes the second person's laughter makes the first person laugh even harder. What is it that passes from the person who's laughing out of amazement to the second person laughing? Well, I don't know. Um, this is one of those books where the questions are way better than the answers. So here's the answer by uh, the philosopher Miskaway. And by the way, even at the time, people thought Abu Hayyan, the question asker, was way more interesting than Miskaway, except for we learned most of that from Abu Hayyan himself. So I'm not sure if we can believe it. <laughs> I've always thought Miskaway was a little dour. One individual soul can have many. So this is his response. He's trying. And I think he wrote it. I think he wrote the response. One individual soul can have many kinds of effects on another individual soul, some rapid and others tardy. We have already said much about this. The rapid effects they have on one another include sleeping, yawning, and other forms of relaxation. It is a well-known fact that when a person grows drowsy or feigns drowsiness in the presence of a person who is wide awake and feels no tiredness, he causes the latter to grow drowsy and sends him off to sleep. The same applies to people who yawn and shirk work. Something similar may happen with someone who sets to work energetically so that his energy passes over to another person, though the first person remains more energetic and this quality is more evident in him. The reason for this is that the soul is one in its essence, even though it is characterized by multiplicity through multiplicity of individuals. So it is hardly surprising that certain rapid effects of the soul should be conveyed from some individuals to others without any time lag. This process does not require that anything should pass through any physical transfer or motion that unfolds in time. It is enough for two souls to see each other for the effect that one exercises on the other occurs without any lapse of time. On this subtle point, one should recall the effect on the observer of the object of observation for though accomplished by means of the body, it requires no lapse of time whatsoever. Thus, we cannot say that when a person observes a fixed star, there is a lapse of time between the moment he opens his eyes and the moment he sees it. Well, I don't know. I've always found this book to be a repository of wonderful questions and answers that, well, they're very philosophical. Um, one of my colleagues who is a scholar of philosophy has told me this is an extremely important book that sheds light on the philosophy of Avicenna in its formation, because this is uh, this book was uh, composed uh, some 20 years or so before the great Avicenna, perhaps the world's great uh, philosophers. Um, uh, but I've always thought of it as being interesting just because of, well, humor is contagious. Um, this is actually the work I did on this book. You'll see uh, I'm, the, I'm the editor of the book. Um, and uh, what did that mean to be, I, I did the edition of the book. And what does that mean? Well, uh, myself and my colleague, Bilal Orfali, we took a text that looks like this. Um, this is the, this is the uh, cover of the book, um, which contains the title. It's not, the title is not The Philosopher Responds. Um, and it contains notes of all the people who have owned this book and all the libraries this book has traveled through. Um, and this is a page of the book, and we turned it into this, um, which is a typed uh, modern edition. And to do that, we had to make lots of choices. Um, luckily, in this case, or unluckily, there was, there was only one copy. And so sometimes we can't read that copy. And so we had to guess. Um, and we put that in the footnotes and things. Um, Editing a text is like being, in some ways, assuming the role almost of its author. Um, it's a great responsibility. It's one I don't take lightly and I find um, to be one of the most challenging things that I do. Um, I guess one of the, um, I think I might skip over actually this remarkable book because I need um, video for it. So I won't, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Um, one of the great translations um, that's done by the Library of Arabic Literature that I encourage you to check out and I will send you a video about it, um, 
is the work of, it describes uh, the travel of tricksters around this Islamic world of the, uh, in this case, the 12th century. Um, it's a group of tales translated 50 ways. Now the translator, you know how I took some risks in that translation where I sort of used algebraic notation. Um, the translator of this work, Michael Cooperson, took risks um, and I think these risks have really pay, play, paid off. Um, Impostures follows the roguish, and I'll just read um, um, the description. It follows the roguish Abu Zaid Saruji, that's the trickster's name. In his adventures around the medieval Middle East, we encounter him impersonating a preacher, pretending to be blind, lying to a judge. In every escapade, he shows himself to be a brilliant and persuasive wordsmith, a, a player with words, who composed poetry, palindromes, words, uh, words and sentences that can be read one way and, and, uh, and the other way. So uh, man, a plan, a canal, Panama, that's in English. How do you translate it at that into, you know, for example, Arabic? How do you translate a palindrome? Almost impossible. Uh, Michael Cooperson has attempted to do this kind of thing. And riddles. How do you show um, this kind of wordplay? Uh, El Hariri's work um, is notable for entire letters where he used only the undotted. Uh, the trickster uses undotted letters of the Arabic uh, alphabet, the letters without dots. How do you show that? That's almost akin to trying to write English without using the letter A. Imagine, could you write a poem without using the letter A? It would be very difficult. Um, that's called a lipogram, by the way, um, a, a, um, a, a poem that or any, anything that is missing one of the letters of the alphabet. Um, what he did was think about um, sort of showing off in the English language. So rather, if he imagines that this work showed off in the Arabic language, which it did, um, Cooperson showed off in the English language and he, he sort of used many, many different styles of authors um, in, the, in the English language, such as Geoffrey Chaucer, Mark Twain, Virginia Woolf, and global varieties of English, including Cockney, Nigerian English, and Singaporean English. Um, I'll send you a video if you'd like to watch it, um, of which is a remarkable video. I wanted to show it to you tonight, but I don't think we'll have time and it probably you won't be able to hear it. Um, all right. Um, the last uh, book I'd like to talk about uh, tonight, uh, perhaps, is one that I most recently worked on. Um, it's called The Book of the Charlatans. Um, I worked on it with um, uh, this man, uh, who, uh, Allah Yirhamuhu, um, Humphrey Davies, um, here. Um, the Book of the Charlatans comes from the 13th century Syria. Um, its author was El Jobari, as you see on the cover. Uh, does everybody know what a charlatan is? It's a trickster, a rogue a rascal. Um, you might wonder why is there so much interest in rogues, rascals, tricksters from in the Arabic world of the 12th and 13th centuries and in general? Well, I think actually um, perhaps a little bit like authors, many modern authors, rogues were often, a, a, um, it was a little joke. I mean, writers are rogues to some degree. Uh, they come in, they play a little game, they take some money or steal away with someone's uh, attention and, and, then, uh, and then depart. Um, it's very similar. This book, of course, is much more complex than that. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, the Book of the Charlatans is really a trip into the underground. I called it Notes from the Underground. Um, El Jovary was himself a charlatan. Um, the, the translator actually that I worked with, uh, and, and I was the volume editor, that meant that in this case, I uh, worked with the person who had edited the text, that had taken the manuscripts of this work, and also the translator who I spent around half a year with in Abu Dhabi, uh, working every week he'd come with his translations. Uh, um, in this case, he happens to be probably the most famous translator um, of Arabic literature into English for the last, you know, probably 50 years. He was a translator of 
uh, some works of Naguib Mahfouz, Ilyas Khoury, Ala Al Aswani, then the list goes on. He translated you know, some 30 books uh, by the time we were together. This one was among, as he confessed to me at one point, was among the hardest. Um, and why is that? Well, a book by a charlatan is probably really hard because it's very hard to sometimes follow charlatans' tricks, tricksters' tricks. And I'll tell you a little bit about the book. The book of the charlatans is like a mirror for princes. That is, it's like a guide for a prince. But rather than giving advice for a good ruler, it, you know, and you know, how to behave in life, how to drink your wine, how not to fall in love. No, it doesn't tell you anything about that. It tells you about depravity like, and fraud, how to rip people off. Um, there are tricks for lighting candlesticks using only your fingers, for forging documents with a powder of white lead. We learn how to make a person instantly collapse by pointing in their direction. And uh, if you have this, uh, brew a potion composed of one part each of blue henbane, opium, lettuce seed, stinking nightshade, she nightshade seed, crest seed, marijuana, and fig milk, uh, and smear it under your armpit. Um, this is what, uh, this is a review, a recent review of the book. Um, uh, this is a fraudulent work of art uh, describing perhaps a fraudulent cure. I can tell you about that some other time. Um, uh, this was the sample that, this is the first piece of the work that uh, Humphrey uh, showed me. Uh, this is the first person that, part I, I ever looked at um, and the one that I really enjoyed. It's, um, uh, the book is wild um, because it doesn't just describe the tricks uh, that tricksters did in the 13th century who were part of this kind of medieval Islamic underground. So basically you're hearing about a part of the world that often we never hear about even today. I mean, uh, you know, to learn about the sort of language of the streets, if you will, is kind of unusual and it's very unusual for the 13th century. The book is remarkable. And so, um, but it's not remarkable just for the telling you about what the tricks were. And those are, you know, tricks of alchemists, fake oculists, um, people, how to feign leprosy, how to rob a house with a turtle, how to dye a horse die, like change a horse's color, how to die a man, um, how, to, uh, how, to, how to practice invisibility, uh, etc. I mean, basically all kinds of tricks. It's not only interesting because it tells us about all of these tricks. It actually tells us how to do them, <laughs> which is very interesting. Uh, and in that, it sort of uh, ties into a tradition of simple machine making that was also very common in the 13th and 14th centuries. Rulers loved, you know, the, you know, the, the sort of water clocks of the Renaissance. Well, the Islamic world was very interested in also simple machines. Um, and so um, they were interested in sort of, this is like parascience, I guess you could call it. And uh, uh, Humphrey uh, Davies, uh, um, he, he kind of liked to think of this book as kind of like a tabloid, like, a, like it was kind of like, <laughs> It wasn't really high literature. It was like the sort of literature that you buy in the in the supermarket. It was not like it was not like a you know a great uh, work of literature. And he wanted to actually translate that somehow. And so he used this word expose, an expose of the tricks of those of the. And this is about Sufis who were the mystics of Islam, who were supposed to be pious men. And this is kind of what pious men did in Cairo in the 13th century. Some, and he says, some sheikhs of this rank, and this is like what he means by rank, he kind of orders the Sufis, like the best ones are really the trickiest ones. They go so far as to descend into a baking pit. And what these are, are massive, they're called tanur in Arabic. It's where we get tandoori chicken. Tanur are um, big holes in the ground that have flames shooting up out of them where you cook bread. To this day in Cairo, you can find them. Uh, um, we have them in Abu Dhabi. And so some sheikhs of this rank go so far as to descend into a baking pit after a hundred weight of firewood has been lit inside. So the thing is flaming. The sheikh, so that is the divine man, disappears for a while and comes back out holding a pot of stuffed fish, 
a chicken casserole, some roast mutton, or whatever else it may be. And this fools everyone and leaves them speechless. Yes, it would. And you know, you can imagine the scene, right? You know, flames are shooting out, and the sheikh comes out holding chicken, you know, chicken casserole. And here is the expose. There are three, and I love the, the thing I love about Ajoberi was he was an expert in you know trickery. He's like, there are three ways of doing this trick, like he's an encyclopedia of it. The first is to have the upper part of the pit fireproofed. This means that the heat of the fire is contained within the upper part of the pit while the lower part remains cool. Uh, um, the next one is sort of like to construct a tunnel. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a crazy sort of story. Well, one of the difficulties in translating this work was simply just understanding it, right? Because it wasn't just understanding the language of the Arabic, it was actually understanding the trick. And I think I was talking with my hands half of the time. We were trying to understand basically medieval juggling at one point. It was an absolute nightmare, but it was actually one of the most fun projects I've ever worked on. Uh, um, I can, uh, I'll read the second type. Um, so the first type is there is a sheet and let's see, the sheet has an empty space in it next next to the pit wall that is made so precisely and tightly that the fire is kept strictly within the confines of the sheet. So long as the sheikh keeps his hand on the edge of the pit, the sheet is held stead steady around the empty space along with the fire above it. And if the bottom of the pit is kept cool and free of fire. So there's some way that he can kind of rest in some area uh, in the bottom of the pit. The man stays there for as long as he knows it takes the dish in question to be done. So he's actually cooking. He's like in the oven and he's cooking the chicken, um, but he's underneath. On his way back up, he picks it up and then feeds those in attendance. No one can go near the pit, so they can actually see inside. This is very clever. He will have prepped it with tarry substances, and the heat will be too great. This is the first type of pit, so he tells us that. The second type is even more extraordinary. The pit is very well constructed, meaning it's made of a grill pit. Beneath it is an underground tunnel, and it, this tunnel goes into the countryside. Such a pit can only be made in a lodge on the outskirts of a city, so you can't do it anywhere. The pit has been constructed as described, and a musical gathering is about to be held. The pit is heated, but the metal sheet at the bottom has to be prepared as described, has been prepared as described. When the sheikh feels the time is ripe, he cries out, exits the gathering, making for the hill or the countryside, and keeps going until he reaches the place where the tunnel begins. He enters and moves along underground till he gets to the pit close to the singer, who will to which the singer will have taken up position. The sheikh now pokes out his head and emerges dancing. Everyone who sees him is astonished and they will all get deluded ideas about him. I saw it done this way myself. You see, he's an expert. Take note of what I've alerted you to, stay away from these vulgar sheikhs and keep your distance. Now, if that isn't a bit of lies, I mean, he tells us basically that he just hangs around with these lowlifes all the time. Um, the third type, there's a third type. The third type involves no sub, there's no trick, there's no subterfuge on their part. The sheikh just smears himself, his whole body with agents that protect against fire and its effects. The following is an expose of their tricks regarding the agents they concoct so as to protect themselves from the heat of the fire. Now, here's the method if you want to know how you do it. How do you protect yourself from a flaming fire in the 13th century? Well, you take frogs and you boil them until their flesh falls apart and not a trace of it is left. Then they take the remaining liquid off the fire to cool. When it is done so, the fat congeals on the surface of the liquid. They take it and add a little bit of saltpeter. If they dot their bodies and their limbs all over with this and enter the fire, it won't hurt them. So it's pretty easy to make. I mean, all you have to do is take some frogs. <laughs> um, Professor Davies sir, was asked uh, if he had tried any of the methods uh, from this book. Um, <laughs> and he said, uh, and you know, one of them was taking, there was a whole very disgusting section on oculists, so people who care eyes, and how to basically um, uh, taking a worm, but faking, the worm is fake, how to take a fake worm out of someone's eye to show them that they've been healed. <laughs> Great. Uh, for myself, uh, this is the interview, the interviewer, I tr attempted the onion juice invisible ink, sort of, that was the easiest thing you could possibly do. 
Many of them seem ridiculously elaborate, at least by today's standards. It might be, make a very en entertaining you know, TikTok video to go through them and try them. And uh, you can look at what the flying paper uh, is. Uh, Humphrey Davies uh, answered, um, and I remember him telling me this joke, I begged the publisher to put the book out with a paper band around it saying, keep out of the reach of children, do not try these tricks at home. <laughs> but apparently, you know, we don't want people climbing into ovens and uh, doing and smearing themselves with frog fat. Um, but apparently the publishers denied this, they saying it costs too much. Uh, and um, yeah, frog fat is not in ready supply these days. Uh, so um, this is the book. Uh, it was a really uh, a great pleasure uh, to work on it. Um, I think I'll stop there actually, if there are any questions either about um, you know, what it's like to work on this sort of thing, maybe I'll pause the um, share. I apologize that I didn't get to show you, I think in some ways the most daring of the translations, but um, I can leave you with our website. We, we have a lot of, um, we have a lot of um, materials online, so, um, and hopefully I can stop the share here. If you have questions, uh, would you please raise your hand? Let's see. Okay. Let's remove screen share. Yeah. Actually, I'm trying to do it and I'm not having luck here. Ah, okay, yes. Let me start my video. And okay, and I'm going to stop the share. Yes. Hello. Okay. Hello. So, uh, usually it takes a couple of minutes, but Lydia Levant has already a question. <laughs> Lydia, go ahead. Hi, it's me. Um, I was curious, similar to your colleague who had that moment where he knew that he would want to kind of study that Arabic going forward. What mm -hmm. was that? Was that for you at Chicago or did you go into it knowing that? Um, no, I had a moment. Actually, I had the book that I read. I would have quit if I hadn't read this book. Um, I read one book in Cairo. And it became, it was so fascinating to me. I was like, I have to write my dissertation about this book. And I thought that I, I was actually not sure I was gonna go on with my dissertation in Cairo. I was enjoying speaking Arabic. I didn't really, I don't know. I didn't know whether I would you know, do anything. And it was, it was already in, into graduate school where I had this moment where I was like, this is actually what I was meant to do. This stuff is really interesting to me because I was far along. I knew I wanted to be a professor. I wasn't, I think there was no moment early when it clicked. It actually clicked really late for me, but there was an, there was an author um, and this work was very unusual. It was the, what I wrote my first book about. Um, I think I'm still writing a book about it. My next book is actually about this book as well. Um, it's almost a, it, what it is, it's again, a kind of expose written by a very bitter person about um, the court. It's just so unusual. It's such an unusual book. It, it, apparently the author had actually burned it um, um, in his, uh, uh, at the end of his life, not wanting anyone else to read it because it was so fiery. And yet uh, it became something, it's, it's called the morals of the two Wazirs. And it was so unusual. It's so unusual in Arabic literature. It just, it took me by storm. Um, so I, you know, I, I think for me, it was always the thing that I, I found in that book was the, it's the, it's not only an expose, it's also the very much, uh, I found a person, a self there in that book that seemed like something I could almost um, identify with. And so that was a very, that was a big moment for me. I remember it kind of, and then I was like, oh, this is something I want to work on. This is some, this is something I can do. So. Uh, okay, uh, Alex Hankin again. Thank you, Morris. Sure. Alex? Okay, Alex is not ready. Um, I have a question. Sure. So, yes, I'm ready. I'm ready, 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 ready. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so based on what you told us today and showed us today, as well as other things uh, 
seen right before, it sounds like uh, Islamic society in general and Arabic society in particular, they are much more open than these same societies we see today. Is that correct statement? Are, are, I, I didn't hear what, they're much more what? They were much more open. Much uh, in, in certain ways, uh, yeah, that's an interesting, it's an interesting observation. Certainly um, in the periods of the 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, um, they, uh, they often, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, people coming from cities like Baghdad um, to the rest of the world. There's a wonderful traveler, Ibn Fadlan, um, it's a very famous book. He, he goes to the Volga and he meets the Bulgars and he goes up the Volga. <laughs> and he's, what he's actually meeting are um, what we now know to be the Vikings. Um, but he talks about them as if they're, you know, basically he's afraid of them. They're rude savages. <laughs> um, and yet they also, he can appreciate them. So we, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, he, but you see, uh, you see a certain kind of way of thinking about the world sometimes in these travelers texts that is remarkably, yes, remarkably open. Um, I, I'd like to give an example of it, if I may. Um, in India, um, one of the most, um, I think, sensational practices, um, uh, and this is up until the modern period is um, sati, it was eventually, uh, it's when uh, the wife of a, a king, when a king dies, the wife will then immolate herself, will burn herself on the funeral pyre. Um, our first description of this practice actually comes from the Muslim traveler Ibn Battuta, who sees this going on. And um, his description is remarkably open on one level, uh, because what he says, he describes how this according to the, to the religions of India. He says, well, the religions of India, um, this is not a required act. And he says, this is a super erogatory act. It's uh, um, just like in Islam, there are acts that are not required. So he's trying to explain it like an anthropologist. He's like saying, this is, you know, he's an ethnographer. This is kind of what it is. He's very dispassionate. But he describes the scene increasingly like he's entered hell. I mean, because he's writing it. And like he talks about the, the trees coming when it's getting dark and he smells the burning flesh. And actually he describes fainting finally. And, you know, and they have to wake him up with rose water because of course, being an eyewitness to this scene was horrifying uh, to him. And yet he remained, he retained that kind of scientific openness. It's very, to my mind, I think it's very striking and somewhat beautiful in a way, uh, a sense of a, I mean, it's never perfect. The cosmopolitanism is not a perfect, you know, no one is perfectly open. No one is perfectly um, adept at, at, at sort of dealing with extreme otherness. And perhaps, uh, you know, Abu, you know, someone like uh, an Ibn Battuta is, you know, a great example of someone who, you know, even that very, that move from almost dis, dispassionate science to kind of emotion in that passage, I think is, is a great, great example of kind of how on the one hand, um, we might in our science uh, try to be, to be open. And, and yet the, none of us is fully perfect in that way. In fact, uh, we're all deeply flawed. We, we, we are moved sometimes by um, by things that are very deep within us, you know, that our rational mind can't sometimes overcome. And that's, that's interesting. I, I like that passage. It, it was also written after some time. So there was clear, clearly purposive writing involved there. It's not like Ibn Battuta is sort of writing this at the time. Someone actually thought of almost about crafting a passage in this way. That, that to me is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, my question would be uh, about these can we can we call them genres of poetry, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have analogs in Western poetry? Do we um, have 
anything like that. Aside from trickster stories, we have yes. our share of trickster stories that I understand for sure. the rest of it. Um, well, that's a that's a really interesting question. Uh, you know, um, Arabic poetry, uh, in terms of form, the poetry I've shown you at least today, which is kind of the dominant tradition, um, it's difficult actually to talk about uh, genres, although people do, uh, mainly because actually the the on a formal level. All poetry, when you look at it in Arabic, is roughly uh, the same. It has meter and it has rhyme. In terms of theme, and that's actually how uh, Arabic critics look at it, the themes of Arabic poetry are, they're somewhat akin to, th there's definitely love poetry, ghazal, which you could equate um, with, you know, certain short forms of love poetry in the West, um, but it's its own tradition, you know, in, in some ways, um, a ghazal poem, like unlike a sonnet, for example, is a 14 line poem, it has to have 14 lines, a ghazal poem could have five lines, or it could have 100 lines in Arabic. Um, that's true in Arabic. In Persian, actually, ghazal poems have to be shorter. Um, and in fact, they have to have the poet's name at the end. So, you know, eventually what you see is, you know, um, there are some, that the way Arabic divides up the world of poetry actually doesn't conventionally map onto um, Western ideas, even though generations of scholars have tried to do exactly that. And I think, you know, one of the projects actually uh, here as a translator, what you see immediately is that um, it's often your preconceived notions that get shaken because as you read more in this great archive, you start seeing, well, wow, this is a ghazal poem and it's 120 lines. I thought ghazal poems, poems on love should be short, you know, things like that. You, you, you start, uh, I think, questioning your thoughts too. Are there uh, things similar? Yes, I mean, uh, um, you know, we have our travel writers, we have our historians. I mean, there are certain genres that are kind of known in the world, but. I think often there's specificity um, and to think about literature, it's how the particular writer uses that genre is in fact the, the interest, to me, the interesting question about, about genres anyway. Uh, um, you know, in some ways they're, they're um, it's very much a, um, you know, artists found in almost taking conventions and doing something new with them. And uh, uh, so, to, you know, yes, uh, there, there are some there are some mappings, but uh, in the end, I think even the very the very way that Arabic poetry um, is thought about once we start reading the Arab critics is very different. Um, and so it, it took and to read it well, you actually have to kind of go down that alley. You can't sort of stick with um, reading works in in English or in French. Uh, um, no, that's been that's been something that has been. Um, this new generation of scholars are much more inclined to do that. Um, Thank you, Morris. Uh, my, my other question, and probably this is my last question, I will not hold you uh, any longer, is I go back to your translation where you actually decoded a poem. Mm -hmm. So I, I try to understand it in terms of a Western poetry. We use metaphors, mm -hmm. and a metaphor is a word that describes a thing or action by a word that normally is not applied to this mm -hmm. thing or action, right? That's right. But in our tradition, in Western tradition, usually the, the reader can easily guess it. So mm -hmm. we admire elegant and sophisticated metaphors, but we, I don't think that, I don't remember ever guessing what it means. Yes. In the case of your poetry or your poem, you almost attributed his words to something that no one before you attributed it to. So in a way you created your own parallel text. Did anyone challenge you? Well, I think, I, I would say Abu Nawas is already doing what I'm doing. Um, he says, in fact, he says, you know, the wine is a ruby 
the, the, you know, the, uh, the cup is a pearl. I mean, I didn't say that, he said it. Uh, so he's, he's laying bare the code. Um, and I think that's what that poem does. I just read it. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Um, will people challenge me? Of course, people challenge all the time. I, I think though, um, I think in some ways, talking about it and making it plain to a reader is to take a leap that actually pays off. Uh, because suddenly it's something that sticks in your mind. Now, I mean, you could go back to the the rather traditional uh, 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 translation of von Helder, and yes, that's a more faithful way of the, the way the words look on the page. But I would also ask you, reading both of them together, don't you think about this poem differently? And actually, that's adding. I mean, people often talk about loss in translation. This is a multiplication in translation, or you know, this is the way yeah. that translation actually Creation. opens up new vistas. That is having more than one translation. And that's one of the challenges of this series. Um, it's very evident in, in poetry, not so evident in prose. In prose, okay, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to come along and translate the Book of the Charlatans again. I don't think anyone's going to go through that philosophical translation again. It's nice to have, great to have. If you don't know Arabic, great to read. It's a great read, you know, it, you know whatever. It wins awards, people like it, et cetera. Poetry, however, is a different story altogether. Um, what uh, James Montgomery was challenged deeply for his translations. Um, you know why? Because he actually, one rule in Arabic is that a line of Arabic poetry should have meaning in and of itself. And what he did was take a couple of lines and put them together. And that was heresy. However, and in fact, he read that the, the way he translated the opening of Antara's Golden Ode is heretical to the tradition. No Arab critic will like this. They all, everyone tells me how much they hate it. However, I actually learned something from it. Um, and I thought it was bold. And he, he, he sort of in the footnotes, he, he defended himself. Um, he explained, and I could probably at length explain why he did it, but maybe that's not important. For me, poetic, uh, poetic translation should take risks. In fact, that was the problem with the old school of translation as kind of, uh, this is something for a student. No one would want to read it in English. You, there's no way to read it in English because it's not an English poem. Von Helder is, is kind of already a very sophisticated, but still of that school. Um, actually, it was, you, this was a school text at Oxford. He had you know, the Arabic, the Arabic, he would test students to the Arabic test, then the Arabic test, and then give, him, uh, give them his translation. And that, you know, that to me, I think, on some level, while I know that that's a deep part of learning, um, it also, uh, the art of translation is actually multiplying and sort of seeing, you know, how can we see within this tradition something else? How can we make it visible um, to students? And I've, I've actually even written poems about poems. Uh, I, there's a wonderful classicist, Anne Carson, who also is a translator of Greek uh, poetry. And her, much of her poetry is actually things that I'm sure were translations and suddenly she got sidetracked because sometimes there's too much there. You can't like, you can't reduce it. Like I would start telling you, oh, I see a code here. You know, I'd like to tell you about that. And then it becomes a poem. That's what she does. Um, at times I feel like the same need because in fact, you know, it's in some ways the constraint of, of giving, you know, bringing something over to the English reader is, you know, the act of translation itself isn't, there's not enough in there. You need to kind of write more in. And I, I, I definitely love Ann Carson for this reason, uh, the great translator of Sappho. Um, you know, that's a, it's a, and it, you might say that's, a, you know, it's betrayal. Um, however, you know, sometimes to be faithful, you have to betray, you know? Uh, and so there's that kind of move. Um, I'm certainly not alone in that, um, that kind of sense, sensibility, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, Erica Jong translated Sappho probably yes. some 12 years ago. Yes. How, how was different? How it was different? But I don't really, I, I wouldn't really know. Um, I, I've actually read Sappho in the original um, uh, years, years ago as, a, as an undergraduate, but I, I really couldn't tell you. Um, but um, what I'd say of Anne Carson, who um, is a very daring translator, 
she can only be that daring because there were there were you know there's a hundred years of people translating Greek poetry, um, if not more, into English at a very high level. There is not the same in Arabic. In Arabic, where the first you know that, that's the first time this book von Elder is the first person to translate that poem, and so you know uh, uh, into English, and so you know the risk is much bigger. And it's actually, it's the risk I struggle with right now. I'm working on a big translation pro project for this series. I'm the first, well, I'm the first translator since 1911. I, I, I think I can't deviate from the English, from, from what the literal meaning of the text is too much because I'll give students the wrong idea. And so there, there's that problem, you know, that tension. How do you, how do you reconcile being artful with being uh, faithful? Do uh, modern Arab uh, people who speak Arabic language, can they read this poetry and understand it in the same terms as the poet meant? Um, or, uh, well, or the language moved they could, on? They could if they're, if they, you know, if they're, um, you know, it really depends. Um, the knowledge of Arabic um, is, um, you know, Arabic of this kind, uh, poetic registers is hard. Um, you know, Antara is hard for a modern reader to read. Abu Nuwes is not actually. Abu Nuwes, I think I could give that to a college student. They would read it. Um, in fact, it's on the high school curricula uh, in some places, uh, not the homoerotic poetry, not so much the wine poetry. He has some chaste versions, um, like don't blame me poetry. <laughs> don't blame me for what I do poetry, which is very popular among Syrian nationalists. Um, but at any rate, um, he was a, uh, uh um the you know so it's something people can read for sure um it's something that um uh you know uh, educated people like uh you know it's nice to walk around abu dhabi you know uh, uh you know the, our dentist will tell tell me a poem he's read in arabic of abu Nuwes. um you know are are people skilled enough to you know uh, understand nuances of this poetry well that takes you know, that takes years. It's, it's, there's an other, but it's a wonderful thing about Ar Arabic as opposed to let's say ancient Greek where you'd have to sort of study it, it's a dead language. Arabic, classical Arabic is still the same roughly as the Arabic you read in a newspaper. So you could print this today. I, I don't, you know, again, you know, probably the number of people who understand it well is the same as the number of people who understand Shakespeare well without a gloss. Not, not so, as many as they, not as many as they think, you know, so there's a lot of people who think they understand, but, you know, um, so it's, you know, it's a sizable, I guess, to some, some degree. Thank you, Morris. There is one question here and there will be no more questions. Okay. Uh, Zaremsky, I don't know Natasha or Serioza, who is Well, it's Serge, <laughs> actually. Uh, can you say a few words about uh, uh, NYU Abu Dhabi itself? Mm -hmm. uh, is it like part of uh, uh, local intellectual life or kind of a monastery? Yeah. Who are the students and what they're yes. looking for? Right, uh, right. Um, well, we have we have students from over a hundred countries. So that's the first thing. It's an undergraduate uh, institution. It's um, is it. It definitely was designed to be part of the public life of of the of of the city of Abu Dhabi. Um, in fact, from the sort of inception of the university, um, uh, the um, there was a public institute um, which hosted events. Um, you know, prior to COVID, you know, biweekly, triweekly events, um, often with bilingual translation. Um, that's waned, of course, with COVID. Now it's all gone online. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, it's definitely been thought of as, as trying to be part of um, an intellectual life, building that for uh, the city of Abu Dhabi. And, and it really has been, uh, to some degree, transformational. I wouldn't say that, um, um, you know, one area where the university is just starting to enter into is doing events, you know, in Arabic, for example. Um, that's you know very important because um, Abu Dhabi is a city where probably the dominant language or the first the first language spoken is probably English. Um, um, Hindi and Arabic vie with one another as second, third, <laughs> and um, but you know um, this this project, of course, um, you can understand why it would. Why well, would be something meaningful there? Um, 
the university, what are the students going for? Well, um, it's a part of NYU. It's an, um, uh, we have students, um, you know, uh, who are um, among the best in the world. Um, it's, they say kind of it's, you know, 3% get admitted. When they do get admitted, they have almost, you know, in the, I think in the 90% funding, I mean, it's very high levels of funding generally, or, um, I, I think some there's a little fudging with the numbers. I'm not sure whether the three percent is because they count all of NYU in that. <laughs> but at any rate, it's a very very low number. Um, uh, there are students Arabs. There are there are a fair number of Arab students um, from from the broader region because it's convenient to go there. But you know, as I said, a hundred countries. Um, it, it, uh, I would say. Uh, the largest number of students from any country, it's tied between the United States and uh, the UAE. And it's, I think it's at 15% uh, in both of those cases or a little bit more. And you can imagine then the rest of the world is a big place. Uh, so um, it's meant to be a cosmopolitan space. Um, and I think it succeeds that way. Um, uh, you know, what do students help to get? I, you know, it's a telling indication of kind of what the UAE is like at the moment. Over 40% of the students opt after graduation to stay in Abu Dhabi. So, you know, it's actually got a job market um, that needs um, college graduates from high level institutions. I mean, I definitely feel as a, um, for what I do, um, you know where I where where uh, um, where we are at the moment is very much a growth area for education. It, it's very much a region. The entire Gulf is like this, where they have the funding for schools and universities and even higher education. They just opened a, a new graduate school <laughs> in the humanities, um, which is unheard of, and yet uh, um, and social sciences. And yet, uh, you know, it's still um, a place that I think desperately. Um, you know, the larger around us, um, you know, so many countries of the region have suffered enormous brain drain. Um, you know, everyone who was, you know, talented in technical fields or in intellectual fields, you know, a lot have left. Uh, and that's been very, you know, very, very hard. So, you know, in, in NYU Abu Dhabi, when they build a library, actually, when they built the library at NYU Abu Dhabi, and they put all those books, not so many, mostly digital, but I kept saying, you realize that this will be the, one of the best libraries of the region, and that you know this is a really uh, big thing for um, for this for this place uh, and and more broadly. So there's a kind of responsibility that um, so not only I think on this on this sort of you know this kind of area of of you know building a library in that sense, but actually much more pragmatically the education of a of a region. It, it, it actually it, it sort of becomes something I don't know if they intended, but it. It's become something. <laughs> so, uh -huh. Maurice, thank you very much. Um, I think most of us are kind of overwhelmed <laughs> with uh, foreignness yes. of the subject, which is wonderful because this is one of the ways how we learn about something. So I'm very glad that I persevered in kind of pursuing you mm -hmm. and that you came here and it's all happened. Um, thank you. Well, uh, it's my thank pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I don't know who else could deliver this to us. Well, what I would, I would suggest, if you have any interest, I will, I will certainly send around a video of my much more eloquent colleague, Michael Cooperson, talking about his book. But even more so, um, you know, uh, these books are available. They're available on Kindle. They're available on on uh, uh, in paperback and hardcover, and at that website you could find um, um, you know sort of ongoing discussions. So if you're ever interested, if you ever want to learn any more, um, it's pretty much the place to go these days uh, for learning about Arabic literature. So well, if you send us links, I'll appreciate it, and Hello. each of us will go from there at their right. own pace and will All right. do that. <laughs> Very good. All right, Morris. Okay. Thank you. Yes. yes. Shukran. Shukran. Afwan. Afwan. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. And good night, everyone. Bye.